next one is something called the URL, the Uniform Resource Locator. Again, this is something you already know. If you've used the web, you know what a URL is. It's the address bar. It's where you type the website that you want to go to. So you want to go to Facebook, you want to go to YouTube. This is the address of where you're going. It incorporates domain names as locations of the files on the web server, web servers housed uh, websites. Now, real quick, a web server is the computer providing the website that you're looking at. So for example, if you're at YouTube, which you're, should be if you're watching the videos, the web servers at YouTube are providing you the information. They are sending your computer, your video, or the videos that you're watching so you can enjoy them. Browsers are going to send a request to a web server that contains the information you're looking for. The web server houses the website and it sends it back. So what exactly is this URL? And I know we kind of glossed over it. We're going to break it down to more detail. If we take a look at my website, you can see HTTP colon whack whack Mr. Ford's class dot net whack about Mr. Ford. What does this URL mean? We can see the HTTP. We talked about what HTTP was. It's saying this is the protocol. This is the format. These are the rules that we're using. I could also put something like FTP there. FTP, previous video, launches a different service. Now I'm doing a file transfer protocol. But I don't want to do FTP. I don't want to do that. I want to be on the World Wide Web. So I'm going to use HTTP. The next one is Mr. Ford's class.net. This is my domain name. This is where I have purchased the name Mr. Ford's class. You can purchase domain names from different web hosting companies. So I purchased Mr. Ford's class.net. That's my domain name. The .net is something called a top level domain. These top level domains are regulated by different bodies. The .net tells the World Wide Web who's in charge of that domain name service, the DNS, which we'll talk about in a little while. But realize that .net is something called a top level domain. We have other top level domains and you've heard of these before as well. This, this is probably nothing new, but maybe you didn't have a deeper understanding of what these, what these meant. So you probably heard of .com. .com was reserved for commercial sites. .net is network. .edu is educational institutions. Some of these top-level domains require you to prove you are who you say you are. For example, .edu is for educational institutions. Uh, traditionally, you would have to prove to the domain service, to who you bought the domain from, that you were actually an educational institution. If you're watching these videos from a university, you probably have an email address from your university, and it probably ends in .edu, which signifies that you're an educational institution. We have some brand new top-level domains, by the way, which were just released. These are kind of cool. In fact, I think they kind of flooded the market with some brand new top-level domains. And some of these are pretty fun, by the way. You have .computer, .club, .expert, dot guru and dot ninja so there are some really cool new top level domains breaking it even further down so we have the http which is telling the computer we're, we're using the world wide web or using a uh, hypertext transfer protocol we had the domain name the mr ford's class which i purchased then we have the top level domain which would be the dot net then we have that about part that that last part the last part tells the web server where the file is located at it tells the server okay, we're on your server, we're on your computer, we're in your hard drive, here's where you find this particular file. So the about Mr. Ford file, in this case, is found here on that web server. So it tells specifically where that's located at. The next one is something called the domain name server. You are not designed to remember random numbers to remember a web page. If you were to go to YouTube, people know YouTube. Where do you go? You go to youtube.com. If you want to go to Facebook, facebook.com. You want to go to Twitter, twitter.com. If you want to go to CBS, NBC, ABC, you want to go anywhere, you remember the name of the company. You remember the name of the organization. That's not how the computer works. That's not how the internet works. The internet works like your phone. 
Okay, if I want to call my wife, for example, I, in the old days, couldn't just say, call my wife, call Mrs. Ford. I would have to type in a phone number, and I would have to remember her phone number. That's what web pages do. Web pages are actually based on IP addresses. We talked about IP before. Um, IP as an IP address is not as an IP, but um, but IP addresses. You don't remember those. You can't recall those. You can't memorize all the IP addresses for all the sites you want to go to. But the internet doesn't, or the World Wide Web doesn't know YouTube. It doesn't know Facebook. It knows it by an IP address. When you type in Facebook, when you type in YouTube, something has to translate that. It has to say, oh, you're looking for this address. That thing that does the translation for you, that thing that goes, you want John Smith, he's located at this phone number, is known as the DNS, Domain Name Server. The Domain Name Server converts the URL into that IP address, which is where all that good stuff is located at. The next one is something that you've probably heard of. It's called HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. This is the programming language for web pages. This is how you're coding web pages. So, for example, if you were to look at a web page, you're going to see the cool, pretty, fun, neat stuff that you expect to see accessing a web page. What you don't see is that it was written by code. The code is all markup language. For those of us who remember having to use word processing when it first came out, let's say back in the DOS days, I still remember before I could make a word bold, I would actually have to put a markup to say, hey, I want this, you know, boom, bold, boom, put the word, boom, black, bold. I would have to mark up what I wanted to be bold, italicized, new paragraph. I would have to put code in my word processing in order for the word processor to send the correct thing to the printer. Same thing happens on a web page. You want something bold, italicized, you want to insert a graphic, you want to insert a video, you want to insert a game. All of this requires a markup behind the scenes for things to work. We've had different standards over the years. The current standard as of the filming of this video is HTML5. If you do any web development, we have a lot of wussy wig, what you see is what you get, development tools. For example, I like to use Joomla. Joomla, you really don't need to know any code to do. If you want to use Dreamweaver, you don't really need any code to do. However, any web developer will tell you, you need to know a little bit of HTML because things always go wrong and you can only fix that sometimes by going into the code. All right, our last topic for the World Wide Web is going to be the web browser. This is the end user's experience with the World Wide Web. This is your browser. This is how you're looking at the web. It's an application designed to go onto the World Wide Web. It requests information, reads that information, and then presents that information to the user. Typically used to access the World Wide Web, can be used to access other services on the internet or even used on intranets. That means private internal networks. Some very popular web browsers that are out there are Google Chrome. Excuse me, let me say again. I think it sounded weird. Google Chrome, Mozilla, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Opera, and Safari. Again, holy wars have been fought over web browsers. In fact, almost literally, wars have been fought over browsers. Massive lawsuits have occurred over browser issues. I personally am a fan, as of right now, of Google Chrome. I like it. Um, there are some negatives to it. Again, we're talking about Google, so they are data mining you. If you're okay with that, then Google Chrome is a very cool uh, browser. It's cross-platform. It'll work on your Mac as well as your PC. Mozilla Firefox. Pretty good. I used to be a huge fan of Mozilla Firefox back in the day. I really don't like it as much. I think it's become too um, heavy as far as what's behind the curtain there. But I also use it on my computer. Again, this one is also cross-platform PC and Mac. Internet Explorer. Um, as of the videoing of this one, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, yes, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, has told users to stop using Internet Explorer because there is a massive security flaw in IE. I only use IE when I have to use IE. I have always, for the last uh, seven, eight years, felt that way about IE. Uh, Internet Explorer is a default web browser 
on a lot of computers. Um, if you are an IE fan, I would suggest checking out the other two, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox. You can check it out, see if you like it. Opera and Safari. Safari is the built-in web browser for Apple. It's, it's decent for Apple. Again, I'm not a big uh, Safari fan either. They tried to work it on the PC. I'm not even sure if they're still trying that anymore. It didn't really translate very well. Opera is pretty good on a mobile device. I've used Opera on a mobile device. It's pretty cool there, too. Okay. Kind of long-winded there, but there's some really cool stuff about the World Wide Web. Didn't cover nearly half of it, but we covered enough for your course that should get you through as well as give you a good foundation for wherever you go after that. The next video is our last video in the series. This will be 4-5, and we'll talk about cloud computing.